David visits his brother, his brothers who are in the army that's to attack the Philistines. He sees this big galoot Goliath walking around up front, shooting his mouth off, swearing at God, taking the Lord's name in vain, swearing at God's people. And Israel's just sitting there petrified with fear. And this little teenager, young man David, just gets his blood boils. He's seething on the inside spiritually. He just like a pot boiling over on the stove spiritually. He just can't believe this bird is getting away with it, this big ugly galoot. Uglier in a mud fence, walking around up there shooting his mouth off. See? Big old whatever he was. I think doctoral worked one time. The guy was probably eight and a half feet tall. He'd have been an all-star in the NBA, I guess. <laughs> Even the smell would have gotten all the defenders off of him, I suppose. Big enough, big enough to shade an elephant. Or like my dad used to say, big enough to go bear hunting with a switch. Uh, you talk about big, he had his own zip code. He had to take a bath in the satellite dish. Every time he wore high heels, he struck oil. There you go, I don't know. Wore a watch on each wrist, covered two time zones. Every time he went swimming in the lake, he left a ring around it. Well, anyway, he was big, all right? He was... Big guy, seven foot forty. <laughs> Verse twenty six And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And that's about as heavy an oath as you could give that he should defy the armies of whom the living God. Boy, that's right. This young man had the fire of God in his soul. No one should get away with defiling the, the people of the living God. Then in verse 36, David says to Saul, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. He knew he would get him, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. So you know what happened. He had a good old rock concert and rolled his big fat head down the hill, cut it off, put it on a pole, and the Philistines turned tail and headed the other way. They showed him their backsides and sprinted, and Israel cleaned up on them. Look at 2 Kings, Samuel King, 2 Kings 19. You see, the characteristics of Jesus Christ as the root and offspring of David are illustrated in the revelation of the book of Samuel, books of Samuel. So therefore, the courage and the resolve and the enthusiasm and the spiritual integrity and fire that we see in David was in Jesus Christ and even more because David is part of the illustration of the characteristics of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God that worked in him. And just think it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you have at your fingertips that kind of resolve, that kind of compassion, that kind of fire on the insides and mindset to back off the adversary's realm, to destroy the works of the adversary, to put that spirit realm on the run like David put the Philistines on the run. That's all ties into where we are complete in Christ. Second Kings 19, this unbelieving army had besieged Jerusalem and here it says in verse 3, And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble. Hezekiah is the believing king, and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent. This is why, to reproach the living God. The word reproach means to disgrace and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, 
be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Boy, is that a great lesson. See, that's why Christ has no symphonic harmony with Belial, because the words of the adversary reproach and disgrace the living God, and the words of God honor and glorify God and His nature and His perfection. The words of the adversary disgrace the true temple, the believing believers. The words of the true God elevate us, bless us, encourage us, inspire us. Even at times the words of Belial are couched in religious terms, wrong dividing of the word, where the scripture is used against people to put them into bondage and fear. That's a reproach of the living God. And you learn to recognize the difference. By living sanctified, you can tell when the cockroaches are trying to run around your linoleum brain cell floor. And you get them out of there. You squash them. You mash them. You get that gooey stuff all over the floor. Get rid of them. Snap, crackle, pop. Doom. Kick them out, you see. The cockroaches of the adversary's words, fiery darts that come from many times your friends and acquaintances, sometimes from others. The key is you learn to recognize it. Then in verse 16, it says in 14, And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, that's referring to the mercy seat in the temple, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. All condescentio figures of speech. And hear the words of Sennacherib, that's the unbeliever shooting his mouth off, which hath sent him to reproach or disgrace the living God. And God takes them on, knocks them upside the head, takes care of business. It's tremendous. Look at Psalm 42. But whenever the words of the living God are reproached, we take a stand. We confront the adversary. We confront the people at times, of course, who allow the adversary to work through them like that. If they want to learn, they can humble themselves. Here in Psalm 42, we're looking at contextual appearances of this great phrase, the living God, who is in stark contrast to the false God, the adversary, Beelzel Stoop. <laughs> like I call him Lucinerd, the fallen arch. <laughs> as the heart panteth, verse 1, as the heart, H-A-R-T, panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. It's a great verse on what I like to call having a passion for the truth. You know, one of the requirements of the way Corps is a concern for spiritual truths, that a desire and a passion, an ardor, a zeal, an enthusiasm, an appetite for spiritual truth has to stand above all desire, all appetite, all enthusiasm, all zeal, or you got no business being in the way core. And that has to be our driving passion of life by our choice. As a heart panteth after the water brooks, that was David's heart. Look at that tremendous simile, that figure of speech that God allows him to use to describe his own spiritual heart, like I have often say, a passion for truth, an enthusiasm, a desire, an appetite, an affection, zeal, a fervor, an ardor. Whatever words you like, you pick whatever you like, but do it. Get your jollies from the truth above all jollies. You can love a lot of things in life. I love a lot of things in life. I enjoy a lot of things in life, but nothing takes precedent over my passion for the truth. Nothing. And that's what it takes to be core, and eventually when you really see it, that's what it takes to be a disciple of any caliber, a disciplined follower who's not an unfaithful man in time of trouble. And it's just the greatest way to live. We ought to have the greatest passion for the God who's given us life than any other aspect of this life. And then it goes on in verse 2 to say, My soul thirsteth for God. Well, the way you get that thirst satisfied is by the Word of God. 
is working the Word, getting the answers, operating the Spirit of God. To the end, you've got your answers. For the living God. Now, there's some out there that thirst for the dead one, thirst for the adversary, thirst for his ways, his cheap spiritualism tricks, his cheap ways of thinking they're real spiritual. It's all possession and malarkey.